You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Bible answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri, and I'm the moderator of this program. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and brought to you by 57 congregations of the Churches of Christ all throughout this region. We want to welcome to that number the church in Clarksburg, Tennessee. Thanks so much for being a fellow helper with us in this work. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Tony Lawrence, and I am from the Bobby Branch Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Johnny Skaggs from the Bellevue Road Church of Christ in Dublin, Georgia, also the editor of the Gospel Journal. Hello, I'm Jared Skaggs, preacher at the West End Boulevard Church of Christ in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, also on the board of directors uh, for the Gospel Journal publication. Again, we're grateful to have these brethren with us. Some of them have driven great distances to be here. We're thankful very much. Our first question to Tony Lawrence. The person says, doesn't the word for in Acts 2.38 mean because of? I have been taught that the Greek word translated for can indicate causality in order to attain or a result because of and that it is used in a resultant sense in Acts 2.38. They then give an example. They say an example of using for in a resultant sense is the sentence, I am taking an aspirin for my headache. Obviously, this means I'm taking an aspirin as a result of my headache. I'm not taking an aspirin in order to attain a headache. Therefore, we are not baptized in order to be saved. So I gave the question, then gave the example, and now we'll let you deal with that, Brother Lawrence. This is a very, very serious and important question, and I believe it would be best that we begin by reading Acts chapter 2, verse 38, because reading the text also gives a great indication of what we're going to discuss. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, as you address this question, there's two possible ways to address it, and we're going to do both of those. The first one will be to address the question with regards to the original language, and then we're going to deal with it as a parallel passage. When a person begins to address the original language, you have to always begin to ask yourself the question, how often is this word used, and how is it used throughout Scripture? For instance, the Greek word is ace, or sometimes pronounced ice. It is found 1,569 times in the Greek New Testament. In the King James translation, it is translated into 574 times, to 337 times, unto 205 times, and even toward 28 times, but it is never translated because of. When you look at the lexicons, they define the word, for instance, as an extension involving a goal or a place into, in, toward. That's from the Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich lexicon. The Brill's Dictionary of Ancient Greek says toward, of motion, direction, destination, or goal. Or the Abbott Smith Manual of Greek Lexicon of the New Testament. It says expressing direction and entrance. But I think the best way for a person to understand is just look and see how the word is used. And I just want to use one passage to give that indication, and that's Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1. And it says, And he entered into the ship and passed over and came into his own city. The word into the ship, the word into his own city, indicates the progress or going in the direction of. And anyone who is fair and honest with the Greek language will 
come away with a full understanding that it, it always is progressive, that it is going forward, never regressive looking backwards. And so as you think about the original language, the word for and the original language always indicates in order to looking forward, moving into progress, moving toward a goal, toward a direction. On the other hand, however, I don't believe it's necessary for a person to be able to read Greek or be able to parse the various words that are in that language. You can go to a passage that is identical in both Greek and English and that answers the question and that's found in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. And I'd like to read that passage and then I think the answer to this becomes immediately apparent. And there we read, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's speaking about the blood of Christ. And so I would simply ask, did Jesus shed his blood because sins already were forgiven? Or did Jesus shed his blood in order that sins might be forgiven? And I think it's obvious to anyone that Jesus did die on the cross in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins. And so as you look at the parallel between the true, the two passages, it becomes immediately clear that the word for in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 is in order to obtain the remission of sins. And I think it's a wonderful parallel, if you will, to take Acts 2.38 and Matthew 26.28 and point out that Jesus shed his blood in order that sins would be forgiven and that we are on our part as far as our obedient acts are baptized in order to have our sins forgiven. That's such a good question. Thank you. Of course, repent and be baptized are joined by the conjunction and, and what one is the other is, what one is for the other is for. If, if we're baptized because of the remission of sins, do we repent because of sins already remitted? <laughs> of course not. We're still in our sins. That's why we need to repent of them. So that should tell us why. Johnny Skaggs, we have this question. Is it okay for Christians not to attend a local church, but just watch services online, even if they are physically able to attend? Brother Skaggs. Thank you for the question. This has become a very uh, important question on the minds of many in uh, lieu of the uh, uh, COVID that uh, swept through our country uh, the last few years. Uh, during that time, which uh, many churches were uh, just simply having church online and uh, members were staying at home due to the, the epidemic that was going on. And uh, in many places that who, who did that, uh, their members, uh, a lot of them have continued to stay at home and uh, attempt to worship God uh, at home. Let me say this here, uh, many elderships that I've spoken to who, who allowed that to take place have regretted doing so now, wishing they had not done that, wishing they had found a different way to accommodate uh, people at that time or just simply have come together as they normally did. And, uh, but uh, that, was, uh, of course, is another uh, question we can look at some other time. However, let me say this here. I believe this. It is impossible, and underline that word impossible, it's impossible to fill all the requirements that happens on the first day of the week if you are not present uh, upon the first day of the week to worship with the saints. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 34, uh, the Bible says we're to come together. And actually the word come together is used five times in those uh, particular verses, one of those uh, in the negative in verse 34. Verse 18 says, when you come together in the church. Verse 20 says, when you come together, therefore, into one place. Verse 33 says, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And the word tarry there means to wait. Uh, so it's a sense of to wait in one place and anticipate or expect something. So we're to wait in one place together as we come together 
uh, as we would take the Lord's Supper. And uh, as we take the Lord's Supper, that would indicate that uh, we would have to be there together in order to be able to do that uh, as we wait one another uh, within uh, this one place. And so the Bible clearly teaches that we're to come together in one place. We have the examples in the New Testament church of doing that very thing when they came together in, in one place. Now, I do realize, and I think we have to make sure that we understand this, there, there are those who are legitimately sick. Uh, but make sure that you're really sick and you're just not making an excuse to stay home away from services. Uh, if you can go to uh, Walmart and get your groceries on a Monday and you can go to the local restaurant on Saturday and eat uh, in a local restaurant, surely you can be there to worship with the saints on Sunday. And uh, a lot of elderships, they see their members out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but somehow or another they're sick on Sunday. And so uh, be careful that you don't make an excuse that God is not going to uh, be pleased with. Also remember this too, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing with grace in your heart of the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father uh, by Him. The idea there is we're to teach each other in psalms and hymns. It is hard to teach each other when you're not there. And so uh, as we come together to worship the Lord on the first day of the week, uh, we come together to wait one upon another as we take the Lord's Supper. We come together to uh, admonish each other, to teach each other uh, in our singing. And also Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the text says, Not forsaken the assembling ourselves together as a manner some is, but exhorting each other so much more as to see the day approaching. I, word the, I realize the word there, assembling, is not the assembly, but simply assembling. The idea of coming together uh, in one place, as uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 indicates. And the purpose is to exhort one another. You cannot exhort one another if you're not there. That's impossible. And so uh, we come together to exhort each other. Let, let me just say this in, in closing with this answer. I, I want to encourage you to uh, think about your spiritual condition. The, the more you stay away from the brethren and stay away from that environment, the further you will get away from, from, from the Lord until finally you'll just quit watching altogether. So uh, make sure that you do your very best to come together as a, as a congregation to worship together support each other and help one another. Thank you for the question. Well, I think that was an excellent answer and very pertinent to the times in which we live. You know, the Bible does not teach Lone Ranger Christianity, as some people have, have termed it. And we need that association. We need that fellowship. We need that worship with other Christians. That is what God has designed uh, for, for us. And, and it is intended that, that we all work together for the cause of Christ uh, as part of the body of Christ. And so we need to keep, keep that in mind. And if together we can burn brightly, but you know, as they say, if the log falls off, those embers are going to die out, aren't they? We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, My Offering. So this tract is about giving. If you'd like to have this tract or a free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible or both, they're absolutely free, or to send us your Bible question, please do so by contacting us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by our website at www.abibleanswertv.org. And uh, we want to encourage people also to go to our YouTube channel. That channel can be found at A Bible Answer TV. Maybe you have a friend who does not have a cable television. Encourage them to watch A Bible Answer online at A Bible Answer TV. Now you can also contact us by email at abibleanswer.earthlink.net. Or for your questions or for your requests for the track to the correspondence course, you can call our toll-free number, and that is 
0463. I want to encourage everybody to go to the website of the Central Church of Christ also. That's www.centralincville.org. Now back to our questions today to Brother Jared Skaggs. The person says, some teach the doctrine of limited atonement. What are some scriptures which prove that it was unlimited? Brother Skaggs. Well, the doctrine of limited atonement is one of the key components of what we refer to as Calvinism. This doctrine teaches in a nutshell that there is an elect or elite group of people who have been chosen uh, to be saved. And one of the verses that I think they, that is often used to teach this doctrine is found in John chapter uh, 10, verse 14, which says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And as I said, this is, this is the doctrine in a nutshell. I realize that there are variations among Calvinists as to how this uh, doctrine might be taught. However, the Bible teaches a much different doctrine. The coming of Christ was not a limited event. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The preaching of this good news or this gospel that Jesus Christ was to come into the world was to be anything but to a limited audience. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16, the text says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, not to a chosen elect people, and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believeth and is saved, or he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so a choice is given, not uh, to a chosen elect, but to all the world to, that has gone to preach the gospel. And so we see also that God has expressed His desire that all men repent. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 through 31, it says that at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world by righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurances unto all men, in that He hath raised him from the dead. Also notice with me 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, which says, For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of our God and our Savior or of our God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for a limited elect, no, for all to be testified in due time. The, bib the bib biblical doctrine is clear that atonement is only limited by our willingness to obey God and to live a Christian life. And so that uh, is, a, is a good question, and I hope the scriptures have uh, answered that for you. Thank you very much. And now to Brother Tony Lawrence. Are the sons of God, mentioned in Genesis 6 and 2, evil angels? Brother Lawrence. Let's begin by reading Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. Now, when you look at this passage, there are many people who look at that phrase, the sons of God, and they assume that they are angels. And the question is, why might they assume such? Well, if you go to the book of Job, chapter 1 and verse 2, as well as chapter 2 and chapter 38, the phrase sons of God is included there in the book of Job, and they equate the two. But I point out to you that if you read the book of Job, the sons of God there are in heaven, they are in God's presence, and they are good because they're serving God. Well, why then might one want to suggest that these are evil? Well, it's because of the passage that follows that talks about God's Spirit not always striving with man and the evilness that took place. And it's been suggested that what is here are evil angels. 
Well, let me point out to you that there are several reasons why that would not fit with the rest of what Scripture says. For instance, the Bible talking about evil angels does not suggest that they were free to roam as they wished. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, Peter writes, For if God spared not angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them in darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude verse 6 says the same thing, talking about them being in prison or in chains. So we don't have angels just being able to wander about aimlessly and to do as they will and to corrupt the affairs of men. But there's even a more significant passage in my judgment, and that's found in Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus was confronted by the Sadducees who denied angels and the resurrection of the dead. And they asked Jesus a question about a man and uh, his dying and the wife would marry another. In verse 30, Jesus said, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Notice, they do not marry and they're not given in marriage because they're angelic. That would indicate that they're not sexual type beings. Well, if I go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2, it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men are fair, and they chose or they took them wives of all that they chose. So you would not have uh, angelic beings uh, having sexual relations or marrying with because that was not consistent with what else is found in Scripture. Well, then one said, well, what's the proper explanation? Well, the sons of God would have been the descendants of Seth, who were of the righteous line, marrying the daughters of men who were obviously of the descent of Cain, and those two were brought together, and it appears that the descendants of Cain had a greater influence of corruption on those good people who were the descendants of Seth. Thank you for the question. Thank you for that good answer. Now to Brother Johnny Skaggs. Do humans, and, and let me just say, there are three questions here in a row. I don't know if we'll have time to get to all of them or not, but there are three questions in a row that all deal with the subject of angels. This is the second one. Uh, do humans become angels at the moment of death, Brother Skaggs? I could give you a short answer, just say no. But that's not the answer you're looking for. But uh, no, angels, uh, humans do not become angels at, uh, at the point of death. Angels were created by God for one purpose, and humans were created uh, for a different purpose. In Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 1931, you'll recall the, uh, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, while on earth, the rich man, of course, lived sumptuously and fared well. Lazarus, of course, he was a beggar and uh, begged at the rich man's tables, even for the scraps that would fall off his table. And the course of time, the Bible says they both died. But actually what the Bible actually says is that the rich man died and was buried. And then Lazarus, uh, when he died, the Bible says the angels, plural, came and carried him into Abraham's bosom. And so there we have the uh, account of what takes place upon death. One, uh, the unrighteous, uh, Lazarus, I mean the rich man, uh, went to torment. Uh, the righteous, Lazarus, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, there to wait till the second coming of our Lord uh, when judgment would take place. Uh, angels were created for the, uh, before the creation of the world. Uh, we read in Job 38, verse 4 through 7, uh, that Brother Tony alluded to, said, Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if thou hast understanding. He said, who, uh, who hath laid the measure thereof, and if thou knowest, or who hath distressed the line upon it? Wherefore upon the foundation thereof fastened? Or who laid the corner of the stone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, it says, uh, uh, shouted, uh, 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 for uh, sons of God shouted for joy. That's of course talking about the angels, how they were there before the world was created. Jesus told the Sadducees that when we die, we become as the angels, not angels. Uh, that is, we do not procreate 
or participate in marriage as the angels do not procreate or participate in marriage. When one dies, they have nothing to do with whatever happens under the sun, uh, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4 through 6. Uh, the text says that they uh, will no longer have anything to do or any knowledge of what's going on under the sun. That's not to say they don't have knowledge. Obviously, uh, the, the rich man had knowledge. Uh, uh, Abraham conversed with the rich man, so there was knowledge going on. Uh, they knew of things that had transpired in their lifetime, but they knew of nothing that was going on at the present time while they were in the, in the uh, condition they were about what was going on in the world at, at that time. And so uh, uh, they will cease to, to have a, a knowledge of anything going on. In, in essence, it's this way. Whenever your loved ones pass away, they're not looking back on us, seeing what we're doing. Uh, that would be sad for them to do that. And of course, that we don't want them to be sad. Uh, but angels are still, we're still their, their ministering spirits uh, sent forth to minister to them that are heirs of salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 14. And uh, so uh, I think that's a very interesting question, and I appreciate the, the question. Thank you to Brother Lawrence, Brother Skaggs, and Brother Skaggs for doing such a great job today in answering your questions. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Someone once said that the Apostle Paul wrote the first 57 verses of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians so that he could pen the last one with emphasis. Well, that's a facetious thought, I guess, but the fact is that even the body of the Christian will be resurrected and united with the Spirit and made immortal and prepared to meet God. And that ought to motivate God's child to do his very best in service of the kingdom of Christ and knowing that there is a reward for godly labor ought to be motivation for us to serve our Lord more and more as our health and as our opportunity allows and to be part of the gathering of the kingdom of God glorified in heaven is among the most thrilling of thoughts for us who labor here for that reward. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.